So I want to introduce our first speaker. I already mentioned Dr. Todd Swick is one of our very, I know Todd, I know you're here and you're not speaking right now, <laughs> but um, he's one of our very loyal um, doctors who, who's here every year and speaks and has a new topic and knows about everything. Um, and so is Dr. Lois Cran. Um, Dr. Lois Cran will be our keynote and she has an incredible uh, presentation for you. Dr. Cran has been treating and working with people with narcolepsy for over 25 years. She has an enormous experience, um, but she comes here every year. She stays, she goes to the sessions, and she learns a lot from everything, and she always says she brings it back home and she learns. Dr. Cran is in Arizona, and she's originally from Canada. So I want to welcome Dr. Lois Cran here. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's very nice to see all of you. And can you hear me? I'm just going to put this away because just the way the angle is, I think I'm going to have to look a little bit at the slide, so I might be wandering a little bit. But it's really my pleasure to be with you today and to have a chance to sort of spend a weekend thinking and talking about narcolepsy. And so for me, it's a real delight to be the first speaker and to be called a keynote speaker. Thank you. Um, we'll get my slides up here in a moment. But in the meantime, I just want to ask um, or say, happy Columbus Day weekend. And it was quite apparent to me when I flew out yesterday that lots of people were going to interesting places because the airport, at least in Phoenix, was quite busy with people clearly going to have fun or doing important things. But I do have one special thing I want to ask. Is anyone here from Canada? Well, then I'll just say, happy Thanksgiving weekend. I don't have to cook turkey this year. No, I, I, I realize for everyone, save the Canadians in the room, you're probably thinking, this is awfully early for Thanksgiving. But I have the perspective that having Thanksgiving in November is awfully late. <laughs> so with that, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about narcolepsy over the years. And this is a really interesting time to be talking because, you know, in a way, we have learned a lot. And that means that all of you who have narcolepsy, all of you who love someone with narcolepsy, and all of us who do what we can to help people with narcolepsy and their families have to be learning all the time because more and more information becomes available. Well, I think it's actually going to only get more complicated because there are a lot of things just around the corner, especially in the area of treatment. Um, and that's going to mean we are all going to have to learn more, but that's wonderful because it gives us more tools to help people. So what I wanted to do is to talk a little bit about how we do research and how important it is, let me see, that we learn together. We can't do research without patients and their families with narcolepsy. And I'm going to just explain a little bit how we learn it for any medical condition. But in this case, I'll be talking pretty much about narcolepsy. So this slide is here to remind me to just say thank you to the Narcolepsy Network. I think that this is a tremendously important organization. And I have the um, opportunity and the privilege to care for quite a few patients with narcolepsy. And many of them are newly diagnosed. They come in, and the question that they are asking and their family is asking, what's wrong? Things just aren't right. And we sort through it and determine that it's narcolepsy. And then what I do is I strongly recommend them to be in touch with an organization like the Narcolepsy Network, which in Phoenix has a very active and effective support group so that a person can meet other people who live with narcolepsy. And I just really appreciate the resources that this organization provides. Uh, I have been coming for a while to the meetings, and it's something where I just want to reiterate, I learn every time I come, and I am a better physician because of the Narcolepsy Network. So thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about. I want to sort of tell a story of how we cannot do research without patients playing a role. I want to tell you about different kinds of research so you can see where patients fit in. And then along the way, I'm going to be giving, especially those of you who haven't come to these meetings before or have a newer diagnosis, a, the way I view narcolepsy. Now, I am not one of the laboratory-based scientists that sometimes comes and speaks here where they are rolling up their sleeves and doing the science and they can get into the details and even I am like really concentrating hard to follow it. Um, I do some research, but my research is much more at the people level, not the sort of knockout mouse level. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the contributions of the very important basic scientists, but I, I, I'm deliberately doing it in a way that I hope all of us can sort of follow, because it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Um, and so what I'm going to do is first talk about how we learn about any disease. Giving, giving narcolepsy as the example, where it starts and where we go. Um, and I'll just, you know, we start usually with a patient's story, and in medicine we call that a case report. And then we get a group of patients, I mean a group of stories, and then we start looking for patterns. And so as I sort of go through this, I hope you'll see how research matures. The more we know, the more we know that we don't know, the harder we have to work, and then we start getting fancier once we sort of have some hypotheses. But, uh, you know, this is, w w my goal is to just help everyone here have a basic understanding of where we started, and it was a long time ago, where we are now, and then most excitingly, where we will be going. So this image um, is one that gets used sometimes in research, and the person in the middle and this person looks quite ill. It's actually taken from a um, file talking about people with cancer. So the person is wearing a hospital gown. But there is more and more of a movement that research should be patient-centered. That really what matters is what makes patient lives better, what treatments make a difference, what can help prevent a disease, and that patient-centered research has picked up momentum and become more of a focus in recent years than it was before. Because every once in a while, and I don't mean to um, poo-poo this, but sometimes research is done for research's sake. And I think that that's all well and good. But for the people in this room and for people like me who see patients with narcolepsy, I want to know what can we do differently and better as a result of research and if we do research for research's sake, that's wonderful because that may lead to things down the road. But I'm very practical about this. And so this image sort of implies that the patient really is at the center of clinical research and even basic research. Uh, and it is an onion. You start with just the basic outside layer. You skin the onion. And then you start working through the layers, and it, you get deeper and deeper and more and more complicated. And that is certainly true of narcolepsy. So let, welcome to the onion of narcolepsy as I see it. And we'll start digging a little deeper and see how far we go. So one other thing I do is I'm very interested in sleepiness, as many of you, I'm sure, are interested in sleepiness. Um, and I'm interested in images of sleepiness because, you know, for everyone who lives with a sleep disorder, there's a, a point in time where their family says, hmm, we all sleep, but your sleep seems to be different. You seem to have more of it. It seems to be, you know, it seems to happen at strange times. And that's a, that's a key time in the life of any person with narcolepsy. And sometimes it's not the sleepiness, sometimes it's the cataplexy or the vivid dreams. But, you know, that means that we have to be aware of where is this switchover point where, you know, I sleep well at night, but, you know, it's for some people, that is too much of a good thing or it's not the right kind of sleep. And so I'm very interested in how we as a society look at sleep and understand sleep and recognize that there is healthy sleep 
and then there is sleep that's pointing towards something else, like narcolepsy. So you'll see these pictures scattered in. I think this is just a guy on a hot day who's been working hard who's sleeping, but maybe he's a guy who has narcolepsy who said, I, you know, if I can take a 10-minute nap, I'll feel better. <laughs> okay, so let me start with the very beginning stage of research. And sometimes this doesn't get a lot of attention because it's pretty basic. But it's basically telling a story about an individual patient that gets everyone to sit up and take notice and say, isn't that something? That's a, that's a little bit different than what we've heard before. And so in the case of narcolepsy, this happened many years ago, more than 100 years ago. And the story was that there was a 38-year-old man who made wine barrels. So he was a hardworking guy, and it was recognized that he was sleepy, but that the thing that I think got everyone's attention way back then was that he had these episodes where he would have an emotion and he then couldn't move. And so this was one of the earliest descriptions of sleepiness and cataplexy. And the doctor that recognized it was a French doctor named Dr. Gélineau. And it was at this time that the term narcolepsy was coined and has been used ever since. And so that then stands as a recognition that there might be something that may be more than just this one person has, but it takes a long time to go from that first patient, if you will, to something more. And in the case of narcolepsy, the next meaningful thing, and there may have been some small things that I overlooked, but you know, I'm trying to sort of go to the big things here, was probably 50 years later, and it happened to be at the place where I've spent my career, the Mayo Clinic, where a very clever young neurologist said, you know, we have quite a few sleepy patients. And this was Dr. Daniels, and he met a lot of patients. And this is, again, you know, the role people play. They come in seeking care, they tell their story, and a doctor like Dr. Daniels says, you know, I've met a few people with this same problem, and he came up with a list. It was actually a long list. So we went from one patient to like 100 patients, thanks to Dr. Daniels, and he began to say, you know, this probably isn't just that one person in France. There are lots of people that have this problem, but we don't really understand it. Now, in, in fairness and in retrospect, this was really early in the history of sleep medicine as a, as a profession. And so not a lot was known. We didn't know about REM sleep. We didn't do sleep studies. And he probably had some obstructive sleep apnea patients mixed in with his narcolepsy patients. When we look at his reports now, we recognize there are a few that really didn't quite fit with the others. But that's looking at it through the knowledge of somebody in 2018. For him in, in, in the 1930s, this was a tremendous advance because it meant that doctors around the country and around the world began thinking a little more. Maybe it's not, maybe there's some people who have something that's more than ordinary sleepiness and we should be kind of looking at them more closely. So the next stage that I will highlight here happens to be another person from the place I work, Dr. Yoss and Dr. Daly. And this is now about 20 years later and they have taken Dr. Daniel's observations and continued to sort of have a group of people that they're studying very closely. And they, along with a few others, said, you know, there are some, there's a pattern here. And this pattern is these people are sleepier than they should be. They have these episodes called cataplexy, many but not all. They have vivid dreams at night. They have sleep paralysis. And so they were the ones who've been given the most credit for saying there's a cluster, there's a real pattern here, and what could possibly be causing it? And, and this is where they spend a lot of their time, and I'm delighted about that, what can we do to help these people? And so they began to look at some of the medicines that were available in that time, many of which were stimulants that help a person be awake during the day, and use those medicines to try and help people be wider awake. Now, they had some ideas that in through my eyes many years later, I wouldn't agree with. They used medicines a little bit at, at pretty high doses. But even putting that aside, I greatly respect that they said, let's help these people. Let's, let's really do what we can. And so then more and more patients would come to anyone 
who was known to be interested in a condition like this. That's just natural. And that gives them more and more of an opportunity to see the patterns and start saying, what can we do to make a difference? So right now, we just have groups of patients telling their stories and doctors listening. Now, Dr. Vogel is the next one. And uh, I believe he was from Chicago. And I'm afraid I don't have a picture of him. But he really then looked closely. And he said, what is it that might be causing these symptoms? We now know they're symptoms, but what is at the heart of it? And what he recognized, and I'm going to show this image again a little larger, and I'll explain. He recognized that REM sleep didn't seem to be the same for people with this condition called narcolepsy than for other people. And so he had um, the ability to understand REM sleep, and by this point, we had gotten to the stage that we knew much more about sleep. And we had said, there's wakefulness, and there's non-REM sleep, and there's REM sleep. And this is an image. This is actually one of my patients who at, is at the bottom. And let me see if this, uh, oops, oops, that's not right. Let me see if this pointer works. And I'm sorry, I can only point to one, one screen at a time. I should, from time to time, I'll turn around and look at this screen here. Um, does my pointer reach that long, far? I don't see it on the screen. So uh, what I, I'm just going to talk through this. What this is, is this is a graph of what a person's sleep is like at night. And most people are awake. They go to non-REM sleep. And then about an hour later, they go into REM sleep, dreaming sleep. The person on the bottom has narcolepsy. And the, 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 it looks like the skyline of New York City with skyscrapers there. And the first skyscrapers at the very beginning of that image, and then we get into lower buildings, and then there's another skyscraper. The skyscrapers are REM sleep. The image on the top is a person with idiopathic hypersomnia, an overly sleepy person, but not a person with narcolepsy. And they don't have nearly as much REM sleep. And you can see their skyscrapers are skinny and are in the middle, not at the beginning. And that's what Dr. Vogel recognized, that there was something wrong because sleep was popping up where it really didn't belong. And that's actually been something we use to this day when we diagnose narcolepsy, because this is sort of what we look for with a multiple sleep latency test. How sleepy is a person? And does REM happen when it should, or does it pop up where it shouldn't? And that's the heart of that test. And Dr. Vogel was the one that kind of got us looking for that. And I'm a little sorry about not having a pointer, but I hope that, you know, skyscraper, wrong place. So this is another view of REM sleep. And I just want to take a moment. Um, indulge me. I find REM sleep to be very, very interesting. Um, and so what happens in REM sleep is your eyes are moving really fast, and that's where the name comes from. And your body is paralyzed, and you cannot move. So the people are having a lot of dreams, but they can't really move. And so in this image, you can see something clearly is going on in the upper right-hand corner. And th those two top channels are the eye channels. And they're kind of boring for the first half, and then things start happening. That's rapid eye movement sleep. And if you look at the bottom, you see that black kind of looks like a wide pencil mark and then becomes a narrow pencil mark. That is the transition of someone's leaving non-REM sleep. Their muscles are moving normally. And then you can see as their eyes start moving in the top part of that image, their muscles stop moving in the bottom. And that's the transition of someone moving into REM sleep. And why I like to show that, and now I will keep my promise and turn over here, is that this looks almost the same. And this is an image from one of my patients. But this is actually an awake patient. And I, I can tell that, and I'll tell you how I tell. So it's the same thing. Eyes are at the top. And you'll say, wait a minute, those eyes aren't so boring. They're moving. Well, this is a person who's awake who's watching a video. And the video is kind of funny. And this person has developed cataplexy. And so the eyes aren't so helpful, but look at the second to the bottom. The very bottom is the heart, and it's just you know doing its thing. Nothing's happening with a per that person's heart. 
But you can see that the, you got the fuzzy pencil, then the narrow pencil, then the fuzzy pencil. This is an image of someone having a cataplectic event. That's maybe about 20 seconds long. And you can see it looks an awful lot like that one I showed you, which is someone falling asleep. Because cataplexy is felt to be a little bit of REM sleep that's popping up where it doesn't belong, but it's popping up during the day after a person has a strong emotion. And so Dr. Vogel helped us look for this, and this is what we found when we kept looking. And that's really the basis of our understanding of what causes the symptoms of narcolepsy. And here they are just side by side. And you can see the similarities between REM sleep at night and cataplexy during the day. So now you all know a little bit how to read a sleep study. And here's another sleeping person. She looks really content. I'd like to just sort of settle in next to her and, you know, just take a night. You know, she's sleeping in this garden with lots of flowers. That, that, to me, this is a very pleasing uh, picture of a, of a person hopefully having good sleep. So then, once we have a group of patients and we have all their stories, the next thing is to say, well, okay, what's different about this condition, or, and in this case, narcolepsy, than other sleep disorders and other medical disorders and healthy people? And so when research reaches this point, what we start doing is saying, we're going to have people with the condition, in this case, narcolepsy, and we're going to have people who don't have narcolepsy, and we're going to compare them. Because if you just look at people with narcolepsy, they all might look a little as, as alike. So, you know, if you're looking at, you know, mood in a dog and you're just looking at um, Irish setters, they all kind of look alike and you can't really tell what's going on as well. Except if you then had a chihuahua next to the Irish setter, you might, or even better, a cat, you then can sort of say, wait a minute, the cat does this and the dog does that. And that's the way we sort of get to the bottom of these things. And so I'd want to go back to this image just to say that I've already introduced this idea. The way it's easier to see the skyscrapers in this image is when you compare it to somebody who doesn't have the same condition. You can see the differences. They stand out more readily. Um, and that's the way doctors and scientists and patients learn. So Dr. Honda is a very important person in my view. He obviously is from Japan because he was a researcher who really did a little more depression research. And he had a theory that HLA, human leukocyte antigen, which I'll call an immunological fingerprint, was important. And as I understand it, and I hope I have this story right, his theory was that patients with depression may all have the same fingerprint. And he happened to work in a hospital that had patients with depression and patients with narcolepsy. So he said, I need someone to compare my patients with depression to. So I'm going to take this group of patients with narcolepsy. Well, what do you know? He didn't find much with the patients with depression. But he found that every patient with narcolepsy had a certain HLA type. They had the same fingerprint. Uh, as I understand it, that was completely a surprise. But he then sort of recalibrated and from that point on began to study narcolepsy. He still looked after people with depression, but he started to study narcolepsy. And he was the one who started to get us all thinking, why do some people get narcolepsy and other people don't? Maybe there's something a little bit different, a vulnerability, a fingerprint, if you will, that somehow means a person's at higher risk Although then, you know, obviously you go from risk to actually having something, so there's more to it than that. But so this was an example, and this is Dr. Honda's book, um, that he, it was because he compared people with narcolepsy to something else that he found this. And that is something that has helped everyone since then. It's helped patients because this is sometimes a tool we use in the diagnosis. We certainly use it in understanding the theory of narcolepsy. But it was only when he compared some patients to other patients that this came to light. So the next type of research is really quite different. Um, so, so far, it's been a, a doctor and his team who knows his patients, or, and actually it is his patients, so far there aren't any women in here, um, who's looking for patterns. Once you have enough of information, you can then look from a different perspective. So you take a large population, let's say a whole community or a whole country, and say, 
what can we learn about this disease, narcolepsy, by looking at this very big population? And so this has been done a couple of different ways. Some of the doctors at Stanford, who've been very interested in narcolepsy for a long time, would put advertisements out and say, if you see this advertisement and you have these symptoms, call us. And it was a very basic way of trying to figure out how many people in California had narcolepsy. Um, where, again, where I work and Mayo Clinic, um, we have um, for many, many years gotten every doctor, every clinic, every emergency department in our county, which is Olmstead County, Minnesota, to share their records with the patient's consent. And so we can look at every single patient who lives in Olmstead County at a given year and look for diseases. And this has been done for many different things, for osteoporosis, for hypertension, for cardiac disease, for postpartum depression. There have been literally hundreds and hundreds of studies. And so Dr. Silber, um, who's a very thoughtful, hardworking guy, um, said, let's look at narcolepsy. And we, again, had a little bit of an advantage because Dr. Yoss had worked in Olmstead County, so, you know, probably the doctors had been thinking more about narcolepsy than they might in another place. And so we used the records of Olmstead County to look for patterns. And this is when you begin to learn a little bit more about a disease in a different way. And we found that narcolepsy occurs about one out of every 2,000 patients. Remarkably, that was quite similar to what Dr. Dement's work sending out advertisements showed. Um, and so we're pretty confident that that's about the right number. But then you can look at other things, like how does the disease develop? How, how many people a year get diagnosed with it? And you can't really do that unless you have a large sample and say, here are the people with narcolepsy, and here is everybody else. So you've got thousands of other people. And so this is some of our data. And one of the things that we could pretty easily get from our um, information was when does cataplexy start? How old are people who develop cataplexy? Um, and so this is the how many people a year, or how old are people when they're diagnosed with, with narcolepsy? And you can see this is all about teenagers and young adults. And that's been shown time and time again. And then this is the onset of, of cataplexy. This is from another epidemiologic study, but you can see it's the same, that cataplexy tends to start when people are in their 20s. And so this is really important. As you're sort of talking to people, a person comes in who's sleepy, to say, you know, there is the chance that you may develop something else. You right now have just sleepiness, but you might develop cataplexy. And I'll just add, we do know that for some people, the time between when sleepiness starts and cataplexy starts can be really long. And so we always are saying, you know, you don't have cataplexy, but you might, because for, it can sometimes be decades, but for most people it's not. So this is what you learn from an epidemiology study. There's my friend again who's been working hard and taking a nap. So once you get to this point, this is when the basic scientists can really get to working hard. And this is where Stanford University in particular stands out as a place that has a deep commitment to patients. Patients go there, tell their stories, the doctors listen, and they then, especially Dr. Mignot, said, let's really work hard to understand this disease better and let's go into the laboratory. And oh, by the way, in the case of narcolepsy, we know that this is present in some animals most notably dogs, but not only in dogs. Let's learn all we can from narcoleptic dogs so that then we can understand it better for humans. And so they spent many years working very hard studying narcoleptic dogs, and they realized that there was something amiss that I'm going to use two names for this. Hypocretin or orexin wasn't normal in the dogs. Now this gets complicated because the way it's not normal in dogs is a little different than the way it's not normal in humans. But you know, they really recognized that we ought to look at orexin or hypocretin, and it was thanks to their very hard work and thanks to their willingness and ability in a compassionate, caring way to study dogs, study cataplexy in dogs, that they came to that. Uh, and they had a very important landmark article in Cell, which is a major journal, 
that really got the whole world paying attention to narcolepsy and paying attention to hypocretin and orexin and saying, wow, what is this? Let's learn more. Let, and at the heart of it was, let's see what, how we can prevent this disease, help people with this disease. But this really spawned what I would call a avalanche of researchers around the world looking at narcolepsy and hypocretin and orexin. So then once you know what to look for chemically, you can go back to people and say, OK, we know this applies to dogs. Does it apply to people? And I've already foreshadowed this and said, yes, it does, although not quite the same. And so Dr. Mignot and the research team that he works with then started looking at body fluids. And they recognized that orexin levels couldn't be measured in the blood, but could be measured in the spinal fluid. And I don't expect you to really be able to read this slide. But what it shows is there are a lot of dots there. But in that yellow box, there are a whole bunch of dots that are really close to the bottom of the slide. And those are people with narcolepsy who don't have much orexin. And then everyone else is who they're being compared to, where you can see the orexin level can be high, it can be medium. But there are a lot of people who are quite the same. And those are people who have narcolepsy with cataplexy. And so he kept looking at this, he and his team, um, and really could see, that's interesting, uh, really could see that there was something going on here. And this has opened up a whole new world that patients maybe haven't completely benefited from, but I'm quite optimistic in the future will benefit from this. I mean, we, of course, knowledge is power. We can talk to patients, and patients can have a much better understanding of why might I have narcolepsy. It's got something to do with hypocretin, something to do with orexin. I don't have enough of it. But where we all want to go and where we hope to be in the future is replacing what's missing or re somehow boosting and getting someone more of that. Now, the interesting thing about science is sometimes it leads to places you don't expect it to go. And I'm just going to take a little detour here. Because not only have patients with narcolepsy benefited from this work about orexin and hypocretin, but so have people with other sleep disorders. And in fact, they benefited sooner because the chemistry was a little easier. But there is currently a medicine, a sleeping pill, where basically we're trying to give them the sleepiness of a narcolepsy patient because they don't sleep. They have insomnia. Now, this medicine should not be given to anyone with narcolepsy. So just a take-home point, if anyone ever says, the medicine <laughs> called Cevexorant or Balsamer is a good idea, please say, I don't think so. I want more orexin, not less. But people with insomnia have the patients with narcolepsy to thank because they now have a new therapy. Your turn will come. It just is taking longer because it's always easier to turn something off which is what is this medicine does, than to turn something on, which is what we need to do for patients with narcolepsy. But rest assured, there's a lot of work going on trying to turn on orexin to help people with orexin deficient or hypocretin deficient narcolepsy. I'm, I'm not sure he is sleeping where he should. I think he might be getting into trouble. So now we get to the next stage of science where, OK, we've noticed that this applies. We've gone from dogs to people. And then what happens is we go back to dogs, or in the case, or other animals. And so then it's possible to make animals with the disease. And you may hear scientists talk about a knockout mouse. They're modifying some of the receptors so that, and, and breeding mice that are missing those receptors, so then they can study them. Uh, and so that's what's been happening. And I'm not going to go into much detail about that, but just rest assured, lots is happening. I'm going to go back, actually, to the level of epidemiology and just touch upon a sad but important story. So the, the epidemiologists just look for diseases. And they're often looking for outbreaks of infectious disease. Is there Ebola virus? Is there measles? Is there whooping cough? But in Scandinavia, because they have very, very good tracking systems, they were looking, and, and let me walk you through this slide, at how many people got diagnosed with narcolepsy. And they realized that in 2010, there suddenly was a spike. And they said, what in the world could this be? And they got to, ha to work quickly, and they realized that there was a new vaccine for the flu 
and that vaccine seemed to affect the orexin system. And they quickly, this is m very much to their credit, they quickly said, this vaccine can no longer be used, it's off the market, hasn't been used since, and it never was used in North America. But that opened up a new frontier of saying, huh, so we know these people have a fingerprint, the HLA um, um, signature, the HLA B10602. We know that they're usually pretty young when these symptoms start. We know something happens to their erection, but how do we put that all together? And so in this case, when they noticed a sudden surge in narcolepsy, their theory was that something was happening that led to new narcolepsy patient, new narcolepsy diagnosis, and all these pieces were coming together. And that has continued to be a very important uh, area of basic science research. There are no new patients in, Nar in Scandinavia developing narcolepsy because of the vaccine. This was a thankfully short-lived problem, um, although there are new patients with narcolepsy just under ordinary circumstances. But it shows when you start learning more, you really begin to get more sources of information. Now, a scientist who works in the lab would probably take an hour talking about this, and I'm not going to do that. Um, but I'll just say last week, well, September 28th, so a week and a half ago, was another very momentous day in the history of hardcore narcolepsy research because a paper came out in a very famous medical journal, scientific journal, talking about how all those pieces fit together. We're learning from that vaccine story, and they're looking at a kind of immune cell that is a T cell, and there are different kinds of T cells. This really gets complicated fast, but they're recognizing that somehow those T cells don't work right, and it's probably because of an infection or a virus or a vaccine that mimics a virus, and that when people who have the HLA type who are young have this T cell that's doing what it's really not supposed to do. It's sort of, you know, let's say ricocheting around. It damages the erection cells, and that's wha wha where in October 2018 we think happens that causes narcolepsy. And it's been very, very interesting. We've gone from the wine uh, barrel maker in France in 1880 to talking about really detailed chemistry, but that opens up the, the possibility of new therapies, and that's a very important piece here. Uh, and we'll be looking more and more at what irritates those T cells, um, whether, how, which viruses, and can we protect people from those viruses? And when new vaccines are developed, I hope that they next time look before it's given to anybody how much is the vaccine like the one that was given in Scandinavia so we don't have a repeat of that? Uh, and so we're just going to learn more and more and more, and this is where we all have to fasten our seatbelts because this is complicated, and we're all on a learning curve, but it's also very, very exciting. And I just hope that we, um, you know, have more and more tools that help people live with narcolepsy. So the last little bit of my talk, I want to talk about how all of this information then allows people to say, how can we help people and come up with treatments? So there's something called a clinical trial. Some of you may have been in them. Some of you may have heard about them. But I want to explain in a, at a high level what a clinical trial is. I put in a device because some of you may have obstructive sleep apnea and use a machine. And they, clinical trials are done for machines, too. It just isn't as applicable for a person who has simple, straightforward narcolepsy that's not complicated by obstructive sleep apnea. We don't really use devices, but we do in sleep medicine otherwise. So in a clinical trial, you first take the information you've gained already. So from patient stories, from case series, from animal work, from you know, taking animal work to people, and then you start developing molecules that you hope are going to be medicines. And then you get into the phase where those medicines are first given to people. The very first phase, you look for problems. Is this something that a person can take without having massive side effects? So they give it to a small number of people who either are completely healthy 
And this is what they do. Their contribution to science is they say, I'm willing to be the first human to take this medicine. That's a pretty scary thing to do, but thank goodness some people are willing to do it. In the case of narcolepsy, they sometimes will give it to sleep deprived people to just understand how it affects sleep. Still normal people, but with voluntary sleep deprivation. Then they'll go and look for people with narcolepsy and give a small number of people this brand new medicine and study them closely for side effects. Then it moves into phase two, where these are shorter studies, smaller numbers of people. They're again looking for problems, because if something causes you know, major problems, heart problems, um, um, endocrinology problems, it's a non-starter. That's, that's not going to ever be beneficial. Um, and then they start to look at whether it seems to help them. And if they have evidence of safety and evidence of be benefit, it then moves on into the really big trials that some of you may have been in, which is a phase three trial. Um, and in this, they're again looking for problems, but they have people on the, the uh, experimental medicine longer. They have many, many more people in the study. And although they do this earlier, in the phase two as well. They also have a group of people who don't know if they're on the experimental medicine or if they're on a sugar pill, which I'll call a placebo, so that they can go back and compare those on the real pill and those that are on the fake pill. And this is the key part of any drug development. They have to pass that test. They have to be safe and they have to make a difference compared to the sugar pill. But that means some of the people who are being part of this study are on the sugar pill and not on the real pill. But that's an essential piece to developing a medicine for any disease. Um, you have to prove it works. Then once the phase three trial is over, sometimes there's an open label where everyone gets the experimental drug and they're just studied, make sure it continues to work. Sometimes they look at withdrawal, um, they look at side effects. And then once it's approved and available for use, very often, they're, the company that is uh, sponsoring this is encouraged to look for long-term side effects, and we call that a phase four study. And they'll turn mostly to doctors and say, if your patient starts to have headache or especially more serious side effects, fill out a form and tell us so that we can keep an eye on things and make sure we don't have any nasty surprises. So when there's a clinical trial, you know, a whole large number of people with the disease, in this case, narcolepsy, are approached about the the medicine, and some say, you know, that sounds kind of interesting. I would like to be part of that. But usually it's only a few people who do that, and we very much appreciate those people. They go into the clinical trial, and then things start getting narrower and narrower because some people don't qualify, and some people change their mind, and some people are randomized to the sugar pill. So even if you've got quite a few people at the beginning, you, you don't get that many at the end, although they're going for several hundred in a good clinical trial. So that's what happens, If you just to give you some information. And these are some of the things that I'll just say are around the corner, aren't quite here yet, but I either have recently been studied or are currently being studied or will be studied, I, we think. And one has a name that's a tongue twister. It's, the studies are finished. The name is Sol Reamphetol. And, and in a full disclosure, I'll say that where I work, we were one of the study sites for this. At the time, and I have a typo here, it was JZP110. The name of that study was the TONE study. And it was given to people with sleepiness related to narcolepsy and sleepiness related to obstructive sleep apnea. All the, the, the information has been collected. It's been presented in a couple of scientific meetings, and the FDA will tell us at the end of December whether they're going to approve it or not, or if they have any concerns that need more research. So that's quite exciting, because that's not far away. Patolasant is a different one, and you'll see I have a different symbol there. It's a medication that's available in Europe where they tested it, and they said that it was effective and it didn't cause problems. It works through histamine. And it's being used for people with narcolepsy outside of research in Europe. And the company has said, you know, this seems to be a very good drug. And they're not going to repeat the research in the United States or Canada. They are going to submit their European data to the FDA. 
Um, but in the meantime, they're saying to doctors who are interested in narcolepsy, we're willing to have an early access program where, um, you know, if you want to, to find patients who'd like to try an unapproved medicine, um, you have to get their consent, you have to monitor them for side effects. They're not going to be in a research study and there's not going to be a placebo, but we're going to make this available while we're waiting to hear back from the FDA. So that's one that's already available in some places around the United States. It doesn't have a brand name here until it's approved. It's called Wakex in Europe. Patolosant would be the generic name. Then there is a study underway, um, which is a sodium oxabate study that is a once a night form of it. And that's a study where they're recruiting people who have narcolepsy with cataplexy. Some will be on the real drug, some will be on the placebo. And they are comparing them to see is it safe, does it have problems, and does it help? Then there's another study that's underway that I think is going quite quickly, so may almost be done, which is by the company that uh, produces and markets Xyrum, where they've come up with a different formulation of sodium oxabate, where they're trying to use less sodium and change the way the chemical works. So that's a study that's currently underway too. I mean, in my 25 years of doing this, I've never had so many things that are like being studied medication-wise or just around the corner. And then the last one here, TAK925, is actually an effort to come up with something that's like the opposite of the solrevexorant. It turns on orexin and is meant to be a molecular pharmacology to work through orexin receptors. That's, that is coming, it's a long ways off, but it's already been given to people. Uh, as I understand it, sleep deprived people. Um, so it's, it's coming. Um, and that's quite an exciting thing because that may be highly specific for the treatment of narcolepsy if it doesn't prove to have problems and if it proves to work. So there's lots and lots and lots going on. Um, we're using the information we have gained thanks to patients coming to their doctors, their, they and their family saying, I think something's wrong. I'm a little sleepier than I should be, or I'm a lot sleepier than I should be. And I have these episodes where I suddenly go limp. And from that, we have gained all this information. Um, we have a lot of work to do to help people who have narcolepsy without cataplexy. That has not gotten as much attention. And, and people who have idiopathic hypersomnia. And I suspect that some of the people here fall into those categories. They're important categories. And I didn't talk about it, but now there are some studies looking at new um, therapies for idiopathic hypersomnia. And that's the first time ever that a company or a group of researchers has said, let's see if we can help people with idiopathic hypersomnia rather than just take what we know about narcolepsy and apply it to them. Let's see if there's something that's a little more special, a little more different for them. Other things that are getting a focus that I think really need more attention is how do we diagnose narcolepsy? The MSLT, multiple sleep latency test, where we take Dr. Vogel's observation that REM pops up where it doesn't belong, and you get skyscrapers where there shouldn't be skyscrapers, is still the key test. Um, there is the knowledge that we can test orexin, but in the United States, there's been no laboratory that offers that test. But I'm pleased to say where I work, we are just at the beginning of offering that as a clinical test. Um, so a doctor can do a lumbar puncture and send the spinal fluid, and then the orexin test can be done. I don't have any relationship to that laboratory in case you think I'm sort of plugging that work, but I'm really happy as a sleep doctor to finally have a place where we can measure orexin levels because that's been really frustrating where patients say, and I've had certain people come see me, I wanna have an orexin test, and up to now it's only been possible if they'd been in a research study, but now it's going to be available for people who are just ordinary people who aren't in a research study. Um, and there may be new tests developed. You know, in Europe they do 24-hour EEGs, and I think we need a little more um, to help make sure we can uh, find everyone with narcolepsy and diagnose them. We need to know more about how to treat children with um, narcolepsy, and there's been some effort there lately, which is great. We need to know more about how to treat older people with narcolepsy. The oldest person I've ever treated with narcolepsy 
reach 93 years old. And when you start looking in the medical literature for what medicines are good for a 93-year-old, you don't find much. You just have to, you know, do your best. And I'll say this, this, is, um, this woman was on um, amphetamines in her 90s. And all of my colleagues questioned that. But yet, amphetamines helped her, and we monitored her very carefully. Um, but there isn't a lot of information on how to treat people in their 90s, but I hope all of you live to your 90s and cause your doctor to be thinking and working really hard. Um, the first patient I started sodium oxabate on was having hourly cataplexy, so we needed to help her. She happened to be 78, which is not where you usually want to start a medicine that's been newly approved, but you can't have somebody who's having um, cataplexy that often and leave them. She and her family were so insistent that even if it wasn't well understood in someone her age, something needed to be done. And I'm delighted to say she did so well on sodium oxabate. And she took it to, for the next five years of her life when she died of something else. And it, what, it had helped her, even though she started it at an older age. Then the other thing we really need to do is figure out how can we prevent narcolepsy and how can we make sure there aren't vaccines that are triggering narcolepsy in vulnerable people and so all of that is underway um, and my goal is to do it at the best I can to bring the information back here to people living with narcolepsy so that you are aware of what we know what we have yet to learn and so we can you know help you as much as we can um, and so I just want to thank all of you for coming, for listening, for asking great questions. Those of you who've been in research studies, thank you. Those of you who've gone to doctors and told your story, I bet that, you know, I've had many patients come and say, you know, I had to teach my doctor about narcolepsy because my doctor had never met a person with narcolepsy. Well, thank you for teaching your doctors. And with that, thank you for having me here today. <laughs>